It's layaway for the 21st century, and it slaps, especially among millennials and Gen Zers. I'm talking about the Buy Now, Pay Later, or BNPL, market, which allows consumers to split a purchase of anything, from consumer goods to travel, and even take out food orders into four equal installments. But before you drag it, saying in your best crotchety old man voice, they should just pay cash and learn to live below their means, to which they'd reply, okay, boomer especially considering the industry is expected to have a compound annual growth rate of 45% over the next 10 years. This staggering growth rate is fire and has attracted some of the biggest players on the planet. Can you say Apple? Join Chris and I on this journey as we learn more about the buy now, pay later industry, including how it works, who uses it, its key players, and the accounting and regulatory issues facing these entities. Welcome to Gap Chats, the podcast dedicated to all things accounting, brought to you by Gap Dynamics. I'm your host, Mike Walworth, and with me as always is my faithful partner, Chris Brundrett. We hope you'll join us on our journey today as we share our passion for accounting and help change the way you train. Nice intro, Mike. Trying to use all your Gen Z slang, huh? Now, people can't see us on this podcast, <laughs> but um, I'll just say that maybe we got to back up a few letters in the generation. So okay. uh, n- n- nice, nice try there, Mike. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, in all serious, you know, what are these buy now, pay la- later loans? I-, I didn't even really know that this was a new thing until you told me we were doing a podcast on it. Well, buy now, pay later, or BNPL is a form of consumer credit. It's like old-fashioned layaway plans, except instead of Sears keeping the bicycle in the warehouse until you finish paying it off, you get the bike immediately. At its core, BNPL is a short-term consumer installment loan that lets customers divide a retail purchase, say clothing, into multiple equal payments, with the first payment due at checkout, and the remaining payments are billed to their debit or credit card or, or even a bank account until their purchase is paid in full. All right. Well, that's that's interesting. And, you know, being a few letters back in the generations, I think we remember those layaway, you know, uh, uh, programs that a lot of the big department stores had. But all right, we'll, we'll see if this is any way similar to what we remember from our childhood. But how, wh- why did you decide to do a podcast on this topic? Well, it was interesting. I was reading an article in The Atlantic uh, and it was titled Buy Now, Pay Later Bubble is About to Burst. Well, I didn't really know about the buy now, pay later market, and I thought it would be a cool topic, especially since, you know, you or I probably didn't really know about the industry. And so we'll put a link of that article in the notes section of the podcast. But one of the things that drew me there is the fact that, you know, the first line of the of the article, as people will see, is, you know, you could pay for a sandwich uh, using a buy now, pay later loan. So that was kind of interesting. All right. Well, I'm intrigued. So if I wanted to, how could I get one of these BNPL loans? So if you make a purchase either online or at a retailer, there usually is an option to use a BNPL service offered by one of the major providers, such as loan companies like Affirm, Afterpay, or Klarna. In other words, when you make a purchase, you can pay for it either using cash, check, debit card, credit card, or a buy now, pay later option. In fact, I just noticed when purchasing my monthly allotment of Zen online that I could also pay for this Zen using Klarna. So buying nicotine replacement pouches on layaway. What a world. (laughs) Why wouldn't I just use a credit card instead? Well, Chris, since you are a few letters back in the generations, (laughs) uh, you probably would. (laughs) But perhaps the person we're talking about here doesn't have a credit card. Um, In that article, a Harvard economist notes that most of the people that use buy now, pay later service, either they don't have or they don't use a credit card. In fact, about half of all the BNPL users are 33 years old or younger. And according to this economist, many Gen Zers are skeptical of credit cards. Why would they be skeptical of credit cards? Well, maybe because they've seen their family or friends drowning in credit card debt. Did you know that the average U.S. household has about $6,000 in credit card debt? That seems about right. Yeah, and according to a McKinsey survey, 
roughly 60% of credit card holders don't pay the amount off in full uh, on, when they get the monthly bills. And so as a result, traditional credit card companies earn a tremendous amount of revenue from interest and late fees charged to consumers. And these companies are using that, Chris, in their marketing. This is directly from a firm's website. No fees, no gotchas, no surprises. We're making it easier to make smart choices with your wallet so you can get the things you love without the things you don't. Unlike most credit card companies, we're here to help you, not to profit off of your mistakes or misfortune. When you win, we win. And consider this from Klarna's website. No interest, no catch. Buy Now, Pay Later is an alternative to credit cards and gives you the flexibility to shop what you want, when you want, without breaking the bank. When you split the cost of your purchase into four smaller payments with Klarna, you never pay an interest, ever. Wait a minute. So consumers don't get charged interest. That's right. And this is the real allure for consumers who use this service. The most popular product offered by these companies requires customers to pay off their purchase in four equal installments. The first installment, or 25% of the total purchase price, is due at purchase, with the rest due in three additional equal installments required every two weeks. Therefore, the terms of these loans are very short, maybe around six weeks. However, just like the advertising states, customers only pay the total amount of the purchase with zero interest. Now, I should note that many of these companies do offer interest-bearing installment plan options with various durations. So, so not all of their financial products are interest-free. So are the ones that you know, you're saying charge interest are these longer duration? They would be longer duration. Some of them are just like credit cards. I mean, Clarina has yeah. like a credit card, um, but others are, you know, longer duration, maybe three months or four months. And, and in those, they do charge interest. So what happens if you miss a payment? Because, you know, I imagine they can't come and get that Zin from you. Um, yeah. It's probably been consumed at this point in time. Um, and, you know, we talked about those traditional layaway plans where you didn't get the product until you had made all of your payments. Here we, you know, give the product and and then get the payment. So what happens if you miss a payment? Are there late fees, for example? Yeah, yeah. some of the companies like Afterpay and Klarna do charge late fees. And here's a disclosure from Klarna's website. A late fee of up to $7 may be charged if any scheduled payment remains unpaid after 10 days but this will never exceed 25% of your installment payment amount. So it's not really that onerous. However, other BNPL companies like Affirm do not. They actually don't charge any late fees. Uh, this is their disclosure in their annual form uh, 10K. Our company is predicated on the principles of simplicity, transparency, and putting people first. Since our founding, we have charged $0 in late fees for missed payments. We never profit from consumers' mistakes, and we are always transparent in our product offerings. By adhering to these principles, we have built enduring, trust-based relationships with consumers and merchants. All right. So how in the world do these companies make money? I assume they're not doing this, you know, for charity. Well, it's in that last word that I just said in the, in, in the disclosure, merchants. So from, they get them from the, the merchants or the retailers. Uh, BMPL providers can offer no interest loans because they charge the merchants a fee. And based on my research, this fee can be up to three to four times the average credit card processing fees charged by you know normal credit cards like Visa, MasterCard, or American Express. Wow, that's a lot. And I know merchants you know, are unhappy about just credit card processing fees, which are usually two to four percent. And, mm -hmm. you know, that sounds about I, right. I've often seen I've seen some smaller merchants recently charging extra or or should I say charging less if you pay cash versus using a credit card because they're trying to absorb these or deal with these fees. But so these BNPL firms are charging what, like up to 10 percent? Yeah, I, I saw something uh, on NPR. Uh, this was an NPR article. Uh, that they're charging somewhere between four and nine and a half percent. So your ten percent estimate really wasn't all all that off. Okay, so credit cards usually two to four percent, and now these BNPLs are four percent to nine point five percent on average. So why in the world would a retailer accept that much of a haircut on the goods they sell? They're they're already you know as I said complain about traditional credit card pricing. 
So, and they give us discounts, as I mentioned, for cash payments. So why wouldn't, why would they be interested in doing this? And why wouldn't they just pass this cost on to the consumer? Well, I guess go back to our conversation a few moments ago about the people that are using this service. Remember, it's primarily used by people that either don't have or don't use credit cards, which might be for a host of reasons, including, let's be honest here, they either have no or bad credit. Therefore, hypothetically, these are, you know, quote unquote, new sales that retailers would not have. They would have had it without it, without this Klarna or this BNPL service, at least with these, that's what the BNPL companies are sort of pitching to the merchants. And yes, in my, my estimation, like all costs, presumably they're going to be passed on uh, to the consumer in the form of higher prices. Okay. So how do these firms, like a firm as an example, um, decide who they're going to extend credit to? I mean, I assume they don't do it just for anyone. That'd be pretty risky. No, and, and it's actually pretty quick too. So when you apply for the typical product offered by these firms, like the buy now and pay in four equal installments plan, they usually run a quick, what they call soft credit check, just to help them confirm that you pay your bills on time and doesn't impact your credit score. All right. So a soft credit check, we, we do something like that, I think, when we uh, have prospective employees, when we're hiring. Is that, is that what we're talking about yeah, here? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, so I went on Experian. So they're one of the three main credit bureaus, and they explain a soft credit check like this. Uh, a soft inquiry, sometimes known as a soft credit check or soft credit pull, happens when you or someone you authorize, like a potential employer, checks your credit report. They can also happen when a company, such as a credit card issuer or mortgage lender, checks your credit to pre-approve you for an offer. Soft inquiries don't impact your credit scores because they aren't attached to a specific application for credit. Now, Chris, in, in contrast, a hard inquiry generally occurs when a financial institution, such as a lender or a credit card issuer, checks your credit when making a lending decision. Hard inquiries, they will stay on your credit report for two years, uh, but their impact on credit scores is typically minimal, and that only usually lasts a couple of months. Okay. So, you know, I go to buy a car and I take out traditional financing on that car. I'm going to have a hard inquiry uh, from the bank, right? Um, okay. So I got that. How do I, how do these credit bureaus then, Experian as an example, know if customers have taken out these BNPL loans? Well, here's the, at first they don't. Uh, but if you don't pay, then you better bet that these companies will report your non-payment to the credit bureaus. All right, got it. But how do the credit bureaus know if customers have taken out these BMPL loans? Well, at first they don't because again, a soft inquiry, they're not saying I'm going to extend credit. And so the only way the credit bureaus actually know if you've taken out the loan is if you don't pay it off. Because at that point, these BNPL companies do report your non-payment to the credit bureaus. Well, that sucks. So you mean if I don't pay it it negatively affects my credit, but if I pay it on time, it doesn't help my credit. That is exactly right. And that's one of the dangers of these products for consumers, especially younger consumers. You don't get credit for on-time payments to help build your credit score, which, as you and I both know, is very important in life. In the fine print of Klarna's legal terms, it says that, quote, you are hereby notified that a negative credit report reflecting on your credit record may be submitted to a credit reporting agency if you fail to fulfill the terms of your credit obligations. In addition, because the credit bureaus don't know about the loans, a borrower could, hypothetically, take out a bunch of these BNPL loans at one time, say around Christmas, to pay for expensive gifts for their family and friends. But then, when it's time to pay the piper, they can't pay. They default on their loans, and it wallops their credit. And that's a ding that stays on your credit report for some time. And for some people, that's a big deal. But for others, they don't really care about their credit report. So I do want to ask you, Mike, yeah. I mean, who's on the hook, right? I mean, like if we talk about traditional financing. I go buy a car. I take a loan from a bank. A lot of people don't make their car payments, but the bank is going to come send the repo man to repossess the car. And the bank's then going to sell the car to try and recoup you know, the, the, as much of the principal on the loan as they can, you know, these products are consumable. I mean, you've mentioned Zinn and things like that. I mean, 
how do who's on the hook and you know what happens if a borrower defaults yeah well let's go let's go to the easy question first they're not going to come repossess the zen because the nicotine is already in my body right <laughs> they're not going to come repossess right. your lululemon you know leggings right um, but to your to your point of who's on the hook who's on the hook are these bnpl companies right so they're the ones that extended the credit so just like a bank they're, you know, uh, your bank, I assume, I have no idea about your personal finances, Chris, but I assume maybe you have a, a home mortgage. Well, if you don't pay it, they're going to repossess the home and, and maybe take a loss. Well, the same thing with these guys, just on a smaller scale, they can't repossess the, and, and sort of get a, re, a collection back on the product. But I would assume that this is all sort of incorporated into their models and goes into the, uh, the fees that are probably paid to the merchants. That's sort of why they're they're charging a higher fee to the merchants. Yeah. So so these higher fees. That's that's that now it's making sense. That's why they're charging these higher fees. But I, I guess you're right. I mean, this is all statistics and models and things like that. And if they charge the you know nine point five percent or whatever it is, they know that they'll come out ahead, even if a whole bunch of people default on their payments. Well, that's what they're pitching. You know, obviously these are. These are all kind of new, and we'll get into the players in a moment. But you know, that's what they thought was going to happen. And of course, the BNPL craze it really shot up during COVID, mm -hmm. right? And so it'll be interesting to see, and we'll look at it a little bit later, kind of where these companies are now. Okay, so you mentioned earlier that these firms do offer more traditional financing options. So how do those differ from the typical buy now pay later loan? Well, in this case, it's 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 really more akin to a credit card where interest and late fees are charged for unpaid balances. In this case, the BNPL company would run a hard inquiry and report your payments, good and bad, to the various credit bureaus. Well, that makes sense. So, you know, who are, you mentioned a few, I think, already, but who are these key players in this market, this BNPL market? Yeah, so the key players uh, operating in this industry, there's three big ones, although there's a few big, big ones coming uh, into it in a minute. But the, the big ones are Affirm, Afterpay, and Klarna. Other BNPL companies include PayPal, Layby, Pay Later, that's L8R, uh -huh, PerPay, QuadPay, Sezzle, and Split It. Uh, and so as far as the size of this market, so based on total users, Klarna is, is currently the most popular BNPL service provider, and they have approximately 147 million active users. Affirm is the second largest with 11.2 million active users, and Afterpay is third with about 10.5 million active users. So you can see Klarna is about 10 times the size of those other two. And with respect to the overall market, this is fascinating. According to, what, what firm is this again? Yeah, Applied Market Research. The global buy now pay later market size was valued at 90.7 billion in 2020. That's global. And is projected to reach 3.98 trillion by the year 2030. That's growth at a compound annual growth rate of 45.7% from 2021 to 2030. So that's about what? That's 10 years. This astronomical growth rate has garnered the attention of some rather big companies, including Amazon and Apple. For example, Apple, like within the last quarter, just rolled out a program. They call it Apple Pay Later, which lets its customers split a purchase into four equal installments over six weeks with no interest or fees to pay. Sound familiar? Well, I'm, I'm going to say if Amazon and Apple are all in, it sounds like this might not be just a passing fad. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. So let's look at the U.S. market share for a second. So from 2019 to 2021, the total value of BNPL loans originated in the United States grew by more than 1,000%. Now, obviously, that's COVID in there, right? That's 20, what, it's through 2021. So that's COVID in there. From $2 billion in 2019, to $24.2 billion in 2021. That sounds impressive, but it's still a long way off from reaching credit card levels. So currently, BNPL loans represent only 2% of total e-commerce transactions in the United States. Compare that to Sweden, where BNPL loans represent a staggering 23% of all e-commerce transactions. By the way, Sweden by far is the country where this is the most popular, 
Other countries where this is popular include Germany, Norway, and Finland. And, and here's an interesting thing. I can remember even back when I went over to Switzerland, Chris, with KPMG, and I went to Credit Suisse, and I opened a bank account, and I said, like, I'm going to need a credit card. And they're like, do you want the kind that <laughs> – this is funny. Do you want the kind that comes out of your bank account automatically – or the one where you have to pay off in full at the end of the month. And I'm like, do you have a third option, which is I never pay you <laughs> like we do in the U.S.? And they're like, no, we don't have that here. Now, mind you, that was some time ago. Uh, I am 51 years old, and that was when I was in my 30s. So, I mean, it's been some time. But I, I don't think credit cards and, and the concept of credit card debt is, is the same in Europe as it is here. Well, and we all know Europeans are just very honest, so there's probably no issue whatsoever here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, you know, just overall, you mentioned all these companies, and and we've been talking about how these work. But is is this an ex are these companies examples of what we know as fintech? Right? Yeah, fintech I, I, companies. I think so. So <clears throat> here's how Columbia University defines fintech. They say fintech is a catch-all term referring to software mobile applications, and other technologies created to improve and automate traditional forms of finance for business and consumers alike. And based on reviewing these companies' websites, I think that they would consider themselves fintech companies. I mean, all of them have an app. All of them have, quote unquote, sophisticated models to measure the credit risk like you were talking about. So I think they're probably consider themselves fintech. So, you know, coming from the background that I've come from, mm -hmm. I, the first thing that popped into my head when you started describing this is these companies are not regulated, not regulated like a traditional bank. Well, and, and you, you've hit on a hornet's nest because, you know, I'm, I, I used to audit banks uh, back in the day. And obviously, banks are always complaining. Well, not complaining, but, but they're, they're heavily regulated and, and compliance with regulations is, is, is key for them. Now, they're sort of like, well, wait a second, these fintechs are lending people money and they don't get, you know, all these regulators and all these audits. And so as a result, you know, you're absolutely correct. Right now, there's not a lot of consumer protections out there. However, due to the rise in popularity and the growth of these firms, they have certainly drawn the attention of regulators. So I looked at an article in Forbes and that was dated uh, in October 19th, uh, 2022. And they said that the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau plans to start regulating the industry. The CFPB released a study in September identifying several risks to using BNPL, including, number one, a lack of consumer protections, also the ease of debt accumulation, and the potential for data harvesting. As a result, they say they will issue guidance or a rule to align sector standards with those of credit card companies. The industry has also drawn the attention of lawmakers. I pulled up an article January 14th, so it wasn't that long ago, uh, 2023. It was in the Albuquerque Journal. They noted, and this is interesting, that BNPL Service Afterpay, that was one of the top three, decided to leave the state, joining other providers that avoid New Mexico due to state regulations. The article goes on to say the new state regulation does not prohibit BNPL providers. It merely regulates them and other loan providers, setting a 36% interest cap and limiting late fees. Although Afterpay does not charge interest on its installments, it does enforce late fees. Annual accounting updates are a necessity for accountants and auditors, but that doesn't mean they have to be mind-numbingly boring. Kick off the new year with our essential IFRS or U.S. GAAP update course. Looking for something more tailored to your industry? Did you know we also have industry updates for both IFRS and U.S. GAAP on The Revolution, our online learning platform? You can check out all our e-learning courses available at revolution.gapdynamics.com. That's GAAP with two A's. And while you're there, use the code PODCAST2023. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T. 2023 for 15% off your entire purchase and get ready to change the way you train. All right, so let's dive into the main players. So first, Klarna, what can you tell me about them? Okay, so Klarna was founded in 2005 in Stockholm, Sweden. Well, Klarna was the largest, remember, by active users. And where did I say BMPL was the most popular? Sweden. Sweet. So that makes sense. Yeah. So Klarna right now has 150 million total active customers, including 25 million in the United States. And they process 2 million transactions per day. 
As we stated earlier, it's the largest BNPL company based on active users. It is a private company, but it is backed by some pretty heavy hitters, including Visa and Sequoia Capital, among others. All right. Now, what about a firm? Well, unlike Klarna, a firm is a publicly traded company headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, it was founded in 2012, and the company launched its IPO on, on the NASDAQ, and it went public on January 13th, 2021. So it literally has only been public for, what, a little over a year. Initial price? Two, two years. Two years? Is that right? January 13, 2021. We're in oh, 2023. two years. Yes, you're right. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm an accountant. Uh, yeah, right. so, accountants, yeah. accountants uh, you know, auditors especially live in the past for yeah, okay, the first, yeah. so you know, a little over two years year. old. I'm sorry. So anyway, back in 2021, January, it initially priced its shares at $41 a share and it closed that day at $96.36. So quite a big pop that first so day. So some pretty happy stockholders yeah. on the first day. Yeah. And, and the stock reached its highest level on November 15 uh, November 5th, pardon me, 2021 when it closed at $164.23. That's the day you cashed out, right? I didn't even know about this industry back then, so no, I didn't I didn't <laughs> own the stock. Yeah. All right, so what's the stock at now? Well, it closed uh on January 13th, uh 2023 at $12.88, so considerably lower than its all-time high. Uh, considerably lower is being quite generous. It's down over 90%. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to talk about the current market environment, but first let's round out the top three. What about Afterpay? Well, uh, Afterpay is an Australian fintech company. So this is from their website. So there you go. There's the answer to, are they fintech? They consider themselves fintech. Uh, an Australian fintech company founded in 2014. Interestingly, Afterpay was acquired by Block, which was formerly Square, on January 31st, 2022. That and was one year ago. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> Chris is keeping, uh, yes, it's one year ago. Square, it, it, you might recall, Square was the payments firm of Twitter and was co-founded by Twitter's founder, Jack Dorsey, uh, and Twitter's former CEO uh, before the man-child Elon Musk took over. Uh, wait a minute, what, you don't like Elon? Not at all. Uh, I, I, I can see that he's definitely a smart guy, but I kind of think he's a narcissistic jerk like someone else I'm not very fond of. But that's a topic for another podcast. Anyway. Or so, not. Or not. <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to talk about it. This is not a political podcast. There no. you go. Okay. Anyway, Square shareholders approved an all-stock purchase of Afterpay for $29 billion based on the price of their shares at the time. But by the time the deal actually closed... Block stock had dropped so much that the price tag was only $13.9 billion based on the $113 million some odd shares they offered according to regulatory filings. All right. So now that we've uh, rounded out the top three, what about this current market environment and the impact on these companies? So what did you learn? Yeah. So the, the valuation of these companies are way down. Uh, remember that Forbes article I was talking about earlier, uh, published in October? They stated that these BNPL companies, so like a firm and zip, and I didn't mention zip before, but the firm and zip are down 70%, and Clarna's valuation fell more than 80% in July. And that was July of, you know, 2022. So we're, we're six months from there. So it, right. it, it's probably down even more. So, well, that makes sense. They're facing some strong economic headwinds, as everyone is. Yeah, but it, it's a bit more than that. So remember who uses these loans, right? Gen Zers. And as the case with young credit card holders, BNPL users under 25 have the highest default and delinquency rates. That is not a good sign going into a recession. It'd be interesting to see how the current market environment has impacted their financials, especially the allowance for credit losses. I'm, I'm turning this around to good old accounting here. Yeah, well, first of all, the biggest one, Clarina, it's a private company, so good luck with getting financial information. And as I said before, Afterpay was acquired by Block. Actually, it was acquired by a subsidiary of Block. So it's probably going to be buried under these consolidated financials. And, and really getting the transparent information for the just the BNPL piece of the business might be tough. However, we're in luck because a firm is a publicly traded company. So I did a little digging into their SEC filings. All right. What did you find? Well, their most recent Form 10-K is for the year ended June 30th, 2022 their fiscal year end. And the most recent financial information that was filed and available is their first quarter form 10Q 
for the quarter period ended September 30th, 2022. Long story short, the information, even that quarter, is nearly four months old. I also looked at a first quarter analyst presentation. You are such an accountant. (laughs) Enough disclaimers. Give me the details. All right. Well, the first interesting thing uh, was that, and this was in the analyst presentation, they were actually presenting growth in gross merchandising volume. And that was one of their key performance indicators. But they they, they showed that uh, gross merchandising volume excluding Peloton. And as I noted, well, as noted, I didn't, we haven't said it yet, but as noted in that article in the Atlantic, at the height of the pandemic, Peloton represented 30% of a firm's revenues. And we know what's been happening with Peloton lately. Yeah, it's cycled right off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Also interesting that although a firm and all BNPL companies are known for their pay and for product, nearly two thirds of their transactions represent interest bearing products. And actually, looking at their revenues, it's about evenly split between the merchant fees and interest income. So it sounds like the no interest motto, especially with the slow paying Gen Zers, isn't exactly a winning business strategy. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, also interesting is the fact that since their IPO, they've actually never shown a gap profit. They lost $707 million for the year ended June 30th, 2022. And then they actually lost an additional $251 million in the first quarter ended September 30th, 2022. It's definitely going in the wrong direction. And if you look at their net income chart since their IPO, it looks like what a good chart would look like if it was inverted, right, in, in, in reverse. So the, the net income is continuing to, the, I'm sorry, the net loss is continuing to grow. So circling back to a couple of episodes ago in our podcast, I'm going to guess that they have a non-gap profit. So (laughs) gap losses, big gap losses, but I'm betting they have a non-gap profit. Well, kind of. Okay. So for this was a quarterly net loss chart. So for a few of the quarters, they did show an adjusted operating income just barely in the black. I'm talking about just squeaking over over zero. Uh, But for most of the quarters, they actually lost money even on an adjusted basis, but it was a hell of a lot prettier than the the gap net loss. You better be sure of that. And also I noted that their delinquency rates are definitely going up, nearly doubling as compared to the prior first quarter. So if I compare, you know, September 30th, 2021 with September 30th, 2022, those delinquency rates have almost doubled. So circling back to accounting again, thinking about, you know, current expected credit losses with delinquency rates going up, I'm going to imagine that that allowance for credit losses also went up. Well, you'd think that, but you'd be wrong. So even though these delinquency rates have doubled, there hasn't been a corresponding increase in the allowance for credit losses, which has remained flat. So consider these numbers. So at September 30th, 2021, The company showed loans held for investment totaling $2.2 billion and an allowance for credit losses of $152 million. That's that's a ratio of 6.7%. It's called a coverage ratio, right, in banking. How much coverage do you have? However, at September 30th, 2022, the loans held for investment increased by nearly 20%. To 2.7 billion, but the allowance for credit losses was only 153 million. In other words, it had only gone up one million dollars. The ratio of allowance for credit losses decreased to 5.7 percent. So that ratio went from 6.7 percent to 5.7 percent. So how do they explain that? Well, I looked at their Form 10Q, and here is exactly what they say, and I'll read it to you. Provision for credit losses expense remained relatively comparable period over period with a slight increase of 0.6 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2022, compared to the same period of 2021, primarily due to growth in the volume of loans held for investment, offset by improvements in the credit quality of loans outstanding, and updates to the assumptions used in our credit loss valuation model, including a refinement to the application of our stress loss multiple. Total loans held for investment was $2.7 billion and $2.2 billion as of September 30th, 2022 and 2021, respectively. The allowance for credit losses as a percentage of loans held for investment decreased from 6.8% at September 30th, 2021 to 5.7% as of September 30th, 2022. Well, well, (laughs) updates to the assumptions and a refinement to the application of our stress loss multiple. I can affirm that someone can expect an SEC comment letter. (laughs) 
<laughs> that is kind of funny right there. I see what you did. Uh, we, <laughs> yes, uh, maybe we'll, we'll see. I guess we'll, I guess we'll have to do a, a follow up podcast on it. But anyway, we do have. We didn't get it deep into the accounting for the allowance on this one, and that might be a topic for another podcast. But we do have an e learning course available related to ASE three twenty six, which is the credit losses standard which governs the accounting for the allowance for credit losses under U.S. GAAP. I'll put a link to it in the notes to the podcast. So what is the final verdict after all that? Should people use BNPL loans? What's your opinion? Well, my personal opinion is no, unless, number one, what you are buying is a need, like a mattress, as opposed to a want, like Lululemon leggings. And number two, you are absolutely 100% sure that you'll have the money to make the payments. I think you, you are such a conservative accountant. Yeah. But here's what NerdWallet. So so this is what the Gen Zers use, right? The Gen Zers use the, the website NerdWallet. And NerdWallet, I think, sums it up best. NerdWallet recommends using BNPL only for necessary expenses, like a mattress for your apartment or a computer for school. Though the plan may seem simple and low cost, you're still taking on debt and it's rarely a good idea to go into debt for a non-essential purchase. If you're struggling to pay your bills or start an emergency fund, steer clear of buy now, pay later. Because of its convenience, it's easy to overspend with BNPL. If that happens, you may incur high fees or be sent to collection, which will hurt your credit score. That's sound advice, and nerd wallet sounds a bit like your dad. (laughs) Or yours. (laughs) Why don't you take us out? That's right. All right. Well, that's all for this episode of Gap Chats, your source for all things accounting. Notes and resources from today's episode are linked in the description. And as always, you can find us online at gapdynamics.com and at gapdynamics across social media. It's never too late to become a Gapologist. Head over to our website and subscribe to our blog so that you are the first to know what's new with Gap Dynamics.